Welcome back to our study in the Gospel of Mark. Last week, we heard how Jesus reached, he reached out to both a blind outcast and a rich oppressor. And Jim reminded us that God, praise God, he uses flawed people like you and I to do kingdom things. So today, we, we pick up the story as Jesus continues his journey to Jerusalem. So do me a favor, please open your Bibles to Mark chapter 11, and let's read the text and we'll unpack it together. Mark chapter 11 and verse 1, as they approached Jerusalem and they came to Bethpage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples saying to them, go to the village ahead of you. And just as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you doing this? Say, the Lord needs it and we'll send it back here shortly. So they went out and they found a colt outside in the street, tied at a doorway. And as they untied it, some people standing there asked, they said, what are you doing untying that colt? And the disciples answered as Jesus had told them to, and the people let them go. So when they, they brought the colt to Jesus, they threw their cloaks over it and he sat on it. And many people spread their cloaks on the road while others spread branches they had cut in the fields. And those who went ahead and those who followed, they shouted, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Jesus entered Jerusalem, verse 12, and went into the temple courts. He looked around at everything, but since it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. If you've been with us so far, as we've been going through Mark, you, you know that the tension has been building. Jesus told his disciples in Mark chapter 10 and verse 33, we are going up to Jerusalem and the son of man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the teachers of the law. And they will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles who will mock him and spit on him, flog him and kill him. But three days later, he will rise. Now, you can picture what it would have been like for Jesus and the disciples as, as they joined the massive crowds on the way to Jerusalem. They knew that things were coming to a head. Up until now, Jesus had been avoiding confrontation, by and large, with the religious leaders. Now he was, he was heading right towards a head-on collision with them that would cost him his life. So picture them as they travel from Jericho to Jerusalem. Now, it was mandatory for all male Jews to go up to Jerusalem for the Feast of Pentecost, Tabernacles, and Passover. And Passover was the most popular. Now, the population of Jerusalem tripled in size, maybe even larger than that. As Jim said last week, Jesus would have been with tens of thousands of people walking to Jerusalem to celebrate that God miraculously delivered Israel from bondage in Egypt. Now, Jericho is the lowest city on earth. 800 feet below sea level. And Jerusalem is about 20 miles away, but is nearly 3,000 feet above sea level. Ruth and I have been there and traveled the path from Jericho to Jerusalem. It's really cool. And the road goes through a hot, dry desert. And suddenly, as you approach Jerusalem, you would see the first signs of vegetation. And then you see the glorious sight of Jerusalem itself. I mean, it really is beautiful. You would see the temple the place where God had chosen to place his name and presence, where he assured Israel of forgiveness. And the pilgrims would be singing the songs of ascent from the Psalms as they marched. And the whole experience would take, would take your breath away. So as Jesus and his disciples experience this, something strange happens. Throughout the entire book of Mark, Jesus has never gone anywhere except on his own two feet or in a boat. He's walked everywhere, even on water. But here he asks his disciples to get a colt, a young donkey on which nobody has, has ever sat. And as he approaches Jerusalem, the crowds spread their cloaks on the road. Now, what's, a, what's this all about? Well, in 2 Kings chapter 9, Jehu was made king over Israel. And we read this, they quickly took their cloaks and spread them under him, on the bare steps. Then they blew the trumpet and they shouted, Jehu was king. Now, you don't throw cloaks on the dusty, stony road for just anyone. 
You do it for royalty. Now they're also spreading branches and, and they're singing, blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Palm branches were a, a symbol of Jewish nationality and victory. 200 years before, Judas Maccabeus defeated a Syrian king. He entered Jerusalem and cleansed and rebuilt the temple. And the people waved ivy and palm branches, and they sang hymns of praise. Judas started a royal dynasty that lasted a hundred years. Now, putting this all together, Jesus' followers believe that he is the true and rightful king of Israel. Come to Jerusalem to be seen as such. It's the time of the Passover, the time of hope and remembrance of freedom. As Jesus arrives, Mark is screaming for us to realize the significance of what's happening. Now, to really understand, you have to know what the prophet Zechariah had predicted 500 years earlier. Zechariah had written in Zechariah 9 and verse 9, Rejoice greatly, daughter, daughter of Zion, shout, daughter of Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly. Now get this, riding on a donkey on a colt, the foal of a donkey. And I will take away the chariots from Ephraim and the war horses from Jerusalem. And the battle bow will be broken. And he will proclaim peace to the nations. His rule will extend from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. Three takeaways from our text this morning. First, I want us to notice that Jesus didn't come for empty praise. Mark chapter 1, chapter 11, and verse 9. Those who went ahead and those who followed shouted, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. As Jesus rides toward Jerusalem, the pilgrims surround him, and the hail is approached with shouts of praise. And this is based on Psalm 118 and verse 26, a verse from from a psalm that pilgrims regularly sang on their way to Jerusalem. And and their words not only hail Jesus as coming in the name of the Lord with the authority of God, but, but also as bringing with him the kingdom of our father David. Earlier, as, as Jim said last week, the crowd heard Bartimaeus appeal to Jesus as the son of David a messianic title. Now, the Messiah was expected to be a descendant of David. The entire crowd, some of whom had earlier attempted to quiet Bartimaeus, they now hailed Jesus as the Messiah as he approaches Jerusalem, the city of David. So, here comes a crowd of worshipers to Jerusalem, shouting the praises of Jesus. And the pilgrims are recognizing the, the, the messianic symbolism in Jesus' approach. And they respond in kind. Expectations are high as Jesus carries with them the hopes of the world as he enters Jerusalem. So what's going on here? Well, the people are indeed rolling out the red carpet. Why? Because they believed that Jesus would be the next great king. And as he entered the city, they shouted Hosanna, which means save us now. But, and here's the problem, they weren't crying out for personal salvation. They were crying out for political salvation. The crowd expected Jesus to deliver them from the iron-fisted rule of the Roman government. They believed this miracle worker could perform his biggest miracle ever and restore Israel to 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 the greatness it enjoyed when King David sat on the throne. They were looking for a military and economic king. They were celebrating his arrival, but but Jesus wasn't experiencing any joy. He wasn't smiling and waving to the crowds. Why? Because he knew, he knew these same people yelling, hail him, would be crying, nail him. In just a few days, the same fickle crowd shouting, crown him, would be crying, crucify him. You see, Jesus recognized that it was empty praise. And the people were right. Jesus is their king. 
but he's not here to purge Israel of foreign domination. No, he's here to purge the people of their sin. They're looking and longing for a temporal, political, and military savior. He, however, is bringing what only he can bring, a complete and eternal salvation of body, mind, and soul. They want and expect a savior only for Jews, but he is a savior for the whole world, for any and all who will believe on his name. John chapter 1 and verse 12 says this. I love this verse. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. John chapter 3 and verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever, that's anybody, Whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Acts chapter 4 and verse 12, salvation is found in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. First off this morning, Jesus didn't come for empty praise. Secondly, Jesus didn't come for political purposes. When Jesus was arrested and handed over to Pilate, Pilate asked him if he was a king. And Jesus said this in John 18 and verse 36. He said, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders. But now my kingdom is from another place. Jesus is a king of an eternal kingdom. And those of us who follow him are his subjects in the kingdom of God. Over the next 23 days, we're going to be immersed in an overwhelming political process. Have you ever wondered about the politics of Jesus? Now, there were plenty of political parties during, during the day of Jesus. The Pharisees were the, the staunch ultra-conservatives who hated the Romans. And the Sadducees, well, they were the liberals who befriended the Romans so they, they could get all the prime appointed positions. And the Essenes were the, the true independents who thought both the Pharisees and the Sadducees were of the devil. Jesus' enemies tried to get him to speak out against the Roman government. They tried to make him political. You remember when they asked him about paying taxes? He took a coin and he said, give back to Caesar what is Caesar's and give to God what is God's. He said, if a Roman soldier compels you to carry his pack one mile, carry it two miles. Now, lest you misunderstand me, I think every follower of Jesus should be engaged in the political process. We need believers to run for office. We need to be involved in political discourse. Why? Because the Bible has many ideas about political things. And we need to discuss. Every believer should discuss those things. Every believer should vote using the word of God as their guide. Now, let me just pause for a moment and say this. I can't remember a time when America was more divided than we are at this moment. As a nation, we have turned away from the Lord. And if you're like me, you're thinking, how will we ever find our way back to God? I can tell you this much. Politics will not save us. Putting another justice on the Supreme Court won't heal our land. When all is said and done, our greatest need is not political. Please hear this. Our greatest need is spiritual. We need another great awakening in our land. Perhaps it will come in our day. I hope so. But it won't happen with politics. It will only happen with prayer. I want to give you a challenge. Will you commit to praying every day for revival in our land and in your hearts? Ruth and I do it every night together. We've been praying the prayer of Jehoshaphat in 2 Chronicles 20. Lord, we don't know what to do, but our eyes are on you. Revival in our land won't start in the White House. It will start in God's house. Let me say that again. Revival in our land will not start in the White House. It will only start in God's house. Our salvation isn't coming in on Air Force One. Our salvation is found in Jesus Christ, who will one day return as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And the next time he comes, it won't be on a donkey. Revelation 19 and verse 11, I saw heaven standing open. And there before me was a white horse whose rider is called Faithful and True. That's Jesus. With justice, he judges and wages war. His eyes are like blazing fire. And on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows but he himself. And he is dressed in a robe dipped in blood. 
And his name is the word of God. And the armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen, white and clean, and coming out of his mouth as a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. And he will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. And on his robe and on his thigh, he has this name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. The verses we just read are one day verses. Hallelujah. I can't wait for that day. But before we get there, our most important takeaway this morning. Jesus didn't come for empty praise. He didn't come for political purposes. Lastly, this morning, Jesus came for people. His desire was for people, and that should be our desire too. In Dr. Luke's account of our passage, we we get another perspective of Jesus' entry into Jerusalem. In Luke 19, Jesus is literally coming around the Mount of Olives where his vision is obscured. He's riding in. And and simultaneously, there's rejoicing and there's weeping. By the way, so much of the Christian life is like that. (laughs) That's another message for another time. But Jesus sees the city of Jerusalem. And and he says in, in, in verse, it says in verse 41, as he approached Jerusalem, he wept over it. And he said, if you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace. But now it is hidden from your eyes. Jesus is saying, you've closed your eyes to me. So Jesus has come and the people have closed their eyes. So he says this in verse 43, the days will come upon you when your enemies will they'll build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. And they they will dash you to the ground, you and the children within your walls. And they will not leave one stone on another. Why? Because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. You see, God has come to them. Here is God. And and the people have closed their eyes spiritually. And, and, And he says to them, they say to him, we don't see him. And Jesus looks at Jerusalem and he weeps over Jerusalem as as Nehemiah wept over Jerusalem, as Jeremiah wept over Jerusalem, as Paul wept over those who were of the line of Abraham that closed their eyes to Jesus as Messiah. By the way, Jesus doesn't cry a lot. There are only two occasions that I I can remember in in the Bible where Jesus wept. John 11 and verse 35, where, where his friend Lazarus died. And the Bible has the shortest sentence. It simply says, Jesus wept. And then here, Jesus weeps over Jerusalem. Now, some of you men have been taught real men don't cry. Um, Let me just say this. That's stupid. And it's not true. Real men do cry. But real men cry for the right reasons. When, When God's heart is broken and God weeps, if we have the Holy Spirit in us, we we should have the heart of God. And we should weep for what breaks the heart of God. And what breaks the heart of God is a city that closes its eyes to Jesus. So everyone is rejoicing, but Jesus is weeping. Why? Because he prophesies that the city would be judged because they had been visited by God himself and they rejected him. And so they would be besieged by an enemy who would destroy the city. And that came true around 70 AD when the city was sacked, the temple was destroyed And all that Jesus promised came true. Please, please hear this. There is a window of opportunity that God gives each of us and each of our cities to take the hand of friendship extended to us through the person and work of Jesus and to respond in kind and to say, I will be a Christian and I will walk with Jesus. I will not close my eyes to this Lord, King and Savior. I'll receive forgiveness of sin and eternal life. And I will turn from sin and I will trust in Jesus and Jesus alone. And some of you know the parts of the Bible where it says that God saves people and God elects people and God chooses people and God predestines people and and God does all the work of salvation. But beloved, it should never lead to a hard heart. Jesus weeps for people who reject him. This is the heart of God. And I believe that there is sadness in the heart of God when he looks at the lost. And that should be our heart as well. As the Holy Spirit breaks our heart for the cities in which we live, 
When I think about the city of Fayetteville, it, it should be this continual conflux of emotions. I love my city, but I need to tell them about Jesus. I need to tell them that I rejoice in Jesus. I love him. He's my Lord. He's my King. He's my Savior. And I want him to be their Savior too. So many people in Fayetteville, Arkansas don't know Jesus. And so many lives are ruined because they don't know him. Not only that, like Jesus says, it affects their children. It affects their grandchildren. It affects generation after generation after generation. The rejection of Jesus, it echoes from one generation to the next. And so if you're here right now and you're watching this, you're listening to this, here's the good news. The good news is this. It's not too late for you. For those of you who are not Christian, it's not too late. You're still alive. There could be rejoicing today. Please love, serve, and trust Jesus as Lord, King, and Savior. It's not too late. If you want to do that, please contact us and we'll meet with you. And we'll tell you what it looks like to have a relationship with Jesus. Now, maybe you've already done that. And you want to be baptized. And you want to learn how to walk with Jesus. You want to be discipled. If that's the case, please contact us. And we'll meet with you to discuss how to do that. Now, let me pray for us. Father, we thank you for your truth. We thank you for, for your word. We thank you. We thank you for the scripture. It lives, it breathes, it moves. We're, we're there. And Father, we thank you that our king, the true king, the only king, is alive. Because our king has conquered Satan, sin, death, and hell. Our king has taken the throne. Our king is seated upon a throne. Our king is wearing a crown. Our king is coming again to judge the living and the dead. Our king is coming to put an end to sickness and suffering and injustice and poverty and tyranny and evil and death. Lord Jesus, we confess you are alive. We confess that you died and you rose again. We confess that you are, you are our great king that you are our Lord and that you are our Savior and you are worthy of praise and that we're made for that. And when we do, you get glory, you get joy, and others get saved. And we pray for that Holy Spirit now and into our future for our children and our children's children. We pray for our city in Jesus' name. Amen.